sound test? Yeah. Okay. So cool. we're live. Awesome. Somebody commented, General Kenobi. <laughs> I sent the link to you. Um, Gmail. <clears throat> Is it mm -hmm. <clears throat> so we're just getting uh, the link ready to send out to everybody and then we'll start the discussion in just a few seconds. Double T? Sure. Almost ready. <clears throat> okay. So okay, we have twenty people watching already. <clears throat> Hi guys. Hi guys. We'll just wait for a few seconds. For those of you who are not aware, we have been uh, struck a little bit by lightning here. So uh, a few people are sick and uh, a few people had to change plans in the last few seconds. So we are trying a little different setup than we had uh, originally planned. So that's why we are just setting up the last few pieces now. So uh, we'll be ready. I'm not sure where my, where my previous message went. So...
Is it just being? Should we just? I'll just double check if it went through. <coughs> Okay, so we have the link out to the world. Hooray! And <clears throat> okay. So, hello to some of the people. Uh, it's me, Ashen, says hello. Uh, hello to you. Hi. Cheers, Robert. Oh, should we should we get going? Yeah. Since we already have people waiting. Yeah, and we have a lot of questions <coughs> already in, in the list. So we yeah. do. So we actually uh, we had an episode with Matt uh, a few weeks ago uh, where we went into what do you do for your daily life and what you do in CS. And we asked people to leave questions in the comments of that video, uh, what they would like to hear uh, you talk about in that Q&A. So, uh, if you haven't seen that video, afterward you can take a, look, take a deeper look into uh, Matt's work with us. Um, but so, for now, uh, yeah, uh, maybe you can give a brief, brief introduction uh, what you do oh, for yeah. a living, <clears throat> what you do in CS. How you got here? <laughs> uh, well, uh, first of all, yes. Hi, my name is uh, Mas Steinfeld, and I'm a parachute lead here in Copenhagen Suborbitals, um, which means I'm basically responsible for the development uh, and um, testing and implementation of uh, the parachute system. That is one day going to uh, make sure that the, uh, the, the the space capsule is going to come to a safe landing in the end uh, in the Baltic Sea. In the daily life, I'm, I work in a bank, working with the pricing and uh, business intelligence. So that is uh, pretty far from, from what I'm doing here in my spare time. Um, so, so how I got here in, in the beginning was basically a, a fun story because it started with a discussion over one or two beers uh, one night uh, with some friends um, where one of them uh, said basically that he had started a parachute course and... Uh, um, immediately I thought to myself that I wanted to do the same thing. One thing led to another, and and I also joined um, uh, the, the parachute club and, and started skydiving. Uh, some years later, I learned about a, a group of people who were trying to bring a person into space and safely back again in the, uh, in the middle of, Co from the middle of Copenhagen, basically. And I got very interested in that project, Copenhagen Suborbitals, um, and at, what, at, at one point I noticed some things that were not um, satisfactory to, to my eyes basically on what they were doing around the parachute hatch. So I basically got in contact with the, uh, with the group and, and told them about my concerns and how I thought that uh, the issue should be uh, solved. And uh, the... the uh, question or the, the answer back was basically that uh, if I was so goddamn smart I could come and join them uh, and so I did uh, that's eight years ago now almost and um, here we are today yeah and one other interesting thing I, I guess about your uh, existence in Copenhagen and Orbitals is uh, that not only do you work on uh, the parachute systems but you're also one of the three candidates for the astronaut that we currently have how did you decide to 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 apply for that um it's it's a good question and and basically it's it's a matter of deciding that the opportunity came up that uh, we needed to to point at someone uh, who should uh, take up the seat uh, when the day comes and um, i decided that uh, that was a an opportunity that that I wouldn't miss if I got the chance. So so basically, it was a, to me it was a no-brainer uh, that I wanted to be the one uh, who took the seat. But but uh, the reason I didn't mention it myself is that it is so far ahead in uh, so far out in the future still the uh, the the uh, candidate seat and the the selection of the uh, astronaut that uh, 
in in the everyday life here in Copenhagen, suborbitals, it's not something that uh, uh, take up a, a lot of time in in everybody's mind yet. Um, we have a lot of practical stuff that that we are working on um, in the with the space capsule and uh, thereby also within the the astronaut core, but um, but mostly it's a lot of other practical stuff that that we're working on uh, in in actually building the the rocket and space capsule and all of the logistical uh, stuff that that we're working on, which is eighty percent of the entire project. And that is that is stuff around the actual rocket. Yeah. So obviously we'll have a few questions from uh, yeah from the community about uh, your role as both parachute and uh, parachute lead and astronaut. Um, First, it'd be nice if you guys let us know if you actually can hear us, uh, <laughs> if the audio is, uh, is, uh, is, is, is all right. Um, and then moving on. Uh, okay, so someone says that uh, the audio is good. Excellent. Uh, perfect, then we'll continue. Uh, so maybe first of all, you could give a sort of brief uh, uh, lay the ground where Copenhagen Suborbitals is at the moment. Uh, what have we been doing since we had the successful <coughs> launch of Nexo 2 in the uh, summer of 2018? Yeah, so basically um, Copenhagen Suborbitals laid out a plan in, in uh, 2014 uh, where we decided on technically how are we going to, to put a person into space and safely back again. And that uh, ended up in a design uh, which is uh, called Speaker, the Speaker rocket. And and uh, to get there, we decided uh, on making two smaller rockets, the Nexo class rockets, that was going to learn us uh, the the different technical uh, aspects of what we needed to to get to to the actual Speaker launch. Um, we have succeeded in launching both of those two rockets. And where we are right now is to, to uh, do a detailed design and planning on and building already on, on, the, um, on the speaker rocket. So we are, yeah, we are working on, on, uh, on the speaker rocket right now, and that is going to be the next rocket that is uh, going to be launched from, from our launch platform in the Baltic Sea. I know you've been working on some projects for the speaker rocket as well lately, so maybe you can give us a <coughs> brief look into what have you been doing. Well, from my point of view, I'm uh, from a parachute point of view, I'm not very interested in the speaker rocket itself because uh, most likely that is not going to carry any parachutes at all. Um, we, we we are still considering if we should should add a parachute system to it in in order to perhaps make that reusable as well, but. Um, the main concern from from a from a parachute leads point of view, uh, that is that is of course now the the space capsule itself, and um, and the, the work on that has uh, uh, has been going on steadily for for quite a while now I would say because already in in June last year, we we did a, a triple uh, a cluster test of three parachutes, uh, with a system that is basically going to be the one that uh, <clears throat> brings down the, the, the space capsule to a safe landing. So, so we, um, we've started early on that and uh, we are still developing on it. And in these days, right now, I'm working on, on the, the balloon that is going to be the device that, uh, that stabilizes the parachute on the way down um, through the atmosphere. So, so right now, um, I'm, I'm working on that uh, here in Copenhagen. Uh, in in Florida, we we have Benjamin who is working on the first of the uh, the main parachutes uh, of that cluster. It's uh, a 24 foot uh, diameter parachute, uh, one of three that he's working on. Uh, and uh, just uh, yesterday, he gave me an order then that once uh, that is done and he has uh, sent it over, my task is to uh, test it to destruction. And um, I'm not sure yet how I'm going to do that, but uh, that's a task I'm going to take very seriously. Uh, I think, first of all, we will uh, test it with a guy under it, as we usually do, and then uh, afterwards we'll have to be uh, creative in how we can destroy it. Uh, if you've got any ideas out there on, on a good way uh, to, to safely 
against a parachute to destruction, let us know. And you briefly mentioned that Spica is not, you're not interested in Spica because it's not going to have a parachute system. How come are we making that decision? It would be, be logical to try to save as much of the booster because we spent a lot of time building building it. Absolutely. And, and I was lying a little bit when I said that. And I was <laughs> trying to, to uh, pull back a little bit on it, saying that we, we may add a, a parachute on it. But... Uh, uh, that decision is still up for for discussion because of weight savings and um, and other things to consider. But 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 I think um, it 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 is obvious that if if we can retrieve the the booster again and reuse it once more, that would be a huge time saver for us. So so um, um, so so obviously we will we'll see how we what we can do with that. Um, but, but from a um, safety point of view, I would say that, that my main concern, that is perhaps a better way to put it, my main concern is the, the, the space capsule itself and the, uh, the systems that are, that are going to be put into that one. Okay. And we've all, you've already seen a successful uh, three-cluster parachute, two-stage reefing system <coughs> uh, work right around a year ago in a local uh, skydiving club. Mm -hmm. Um, how is the actual uh, parachute system that uh, that Benjamin is working on be different from from that one? Um, from from the untrained eye, it wouldn't look much different. Um, the the system of the parachutes that we that we used last year for the um, cluster test uh, uh, is a design called the ring slot parachute system. Um, so, so that's a design with the rings, a slot, a ring, a slot, and so on. The um, the system or the design that uh, Benjamin is working on is um, is called a ring sail. So that's slightly different and is basically uh, exactly the same as, as you saw on the uh, Apollo uh, space capsule, uh, which we're going to use a similar setup for. So it's it's the parachute itself looks slightly different, but the um, the setup um, for controlling the opening sequence and pegging the parachute and all the other stuff is pretty much identical to what we did last year with the um, with the test uh, in, in Odense. So, um, <clears throat> so so that's that was a way to to sort of get a uh, a quick way into testing the parachutes that we bought some mm -hmm. cheap from a, from a company in the UK, uh, and they were very helpful in. In getting us, giving us the, the right parachutes for for this task, so we got three ident identical parachutes um, uh, and and modified them for for our purposes basically, uh, slightly off their original uh, purpose, um, but that's the way we roll basically, um, and then we um, yeah bundled the three parachutes together. Climbed into a plane with uh, Ahmed in uh, in Orange and a uh, couple of other cool guys uh, who helped us uh, document the entire jump, and then we basically went to uh, two and a half kilometers altitude, left the airplane and uh, saw what happened. Okay, and if you haven't seen that video, on Google Copenhagen Suborbital Parachute Test. It's a it's a really nice site. It's a really cool video. I really uh, I really enjoy that still. As a bonus, you can see the world's first and only manned balut jump? Well. I, I actually, that is a claim that is no longer true. I learned afterwards, and I'm sorry okay. about that. Uh, I learned afterwards that uh, a similar jump was done uh, back in the 60s, I think. So uh, that claim is no longer valid, unfortunately. Okay. But it's still the first successful triple cluster reefed parachute system, uh, from what I know. With a man. With a man under it, yeah. Okay. Uh, then maybe we can start going into some of the questions because people are, uh, yeah, have a few. Mm -hmm. So uh, first, maybe a good one to start with is going to be from, it's me, Ashen, from the live stream. So what are the easiest and the hardest parts of the of designing a parachute? The easiest is when you, when you have the opportunity to copy something from the internet. Um, it is, uh, <laughs> without a doubt. If you if you can find something that can be uh, be used uh, readily available, then um, that's the way to go. It saves you a lot of time. Um, the hardest thing is to um, 
Ah, that there are, there are many. Nothing, nothing's easy. I would say uh, when when you start actually producing uh, the the items, um, it's it's you have to make sure that this works and is safe in the end. So um, so it's it's hard to get to a level where you're confident with what you've done. I think uh, that was also what you saw back in the days when the when the first uh, manned flights were were performed that. Uh, they became hesitant in actually doing the first uh, launch, uh, and I think it's going. To, uh, it's most likely going to be similar for us uh, when the day comes that uh, that we all of a sudden see all of the things that could potentially go wrong, and and of course that's what we try to do uh, as early as we can in 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 all of these tests that we do. Um, <clears throat> uh, what else is difficult? Um, I think um, I, th I think it's uh, ooh, good question. Let's uh, let's get back to that one. Um, sure. there, there are many uh, aspects to this. I mean, the, for for my for myself personally, uh, that is um, to be also be confident in the quality of the uh, the sewing uh, that I do. I uh, I constantly uh, tend to see things. Uh, that are less than good in in what I do, and um, that's why I practice all the time to become better and better. So, um, yeah, getting to a point where you you trust yourself. Yeah, we can get back to we can get back to that yeah. one if you uh, get more ideas. Uh, the another one question is by Peter uh, Andresen. Um, is it cheaper to make your own parachutes, or what is the reason for not using a standard? commercially available parachutes? <clears throat> uh, yes and no. Um, uh, the, 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 our problem is that we need uh, need the parachutes at, at certain sizes and uh, with, um, with uh, yeah, a certain size, for example, or they, they have to be, be able to fit into something or be able to uh, tolerate a, a certain level of heat. Uh, so, so if if we can find stuff readily available on the on the on the net that um, lives up to those uh, demands we have to everything, then it's it can be uh, better for us to buy it off the shelf. But uh, most often, when we uh, when we find something that that we can buy, it is just a little bit too small, just a little bit too big, or something else is wrong with it. Um, so. Um, for us, labor is cheap because we work for free in, in our spare time. So if as long as we can buy our materials um, and then produce everything ourselves, then that's the cheapest way to do it for CS. Um, but in under certain under certain circumstances, um, if we want to get to a point quickly where we, we want to get ahead on testing stuff, for example, with the cluster parachute, uh, then it's uh, it's a cheap way to quickly get to a point where we can test the the entire system in an almost identical setup than what we want to end up with. So that's why we we bought the three parachutes uh, that we used uh, last year and some years back uh, in order to test other aspects of the uh, opening sequence, um, knowing that uh, these were slightly too heavy and slightly too dense um, with the fabric and then the, 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 the way they were uh, manufactured. But uh, they uh, have given us a lot of uh, knowledge in the area of the entire opening sequence. And uh, I expect still to be using those parachutes for quite a while until we, uh, we have the other homemade uh, parachute system ready to, to be tested. One more question uh, is coming uh, from one of, uh, left on the on the video uh, that we did with you before. Mm -hmm. uh, it's by uh, Raphael <coughs> Schutch, if I'm present, uh, pronouncing your last name correctly. Is how did you learn so much about parachutes, and <laughs> how can he do it too? <laughs> um, <laughs> I think the more it, it it's like the old Greeks said, I guess that the the more I learn, the more I know that I do not know. So um, I think. Um, Basically, as I indicated before, it's, it's a matter of uh, uh, searching on the web, looking up old um, pieces of uh, documents from 
from especially in NASA, I would say they have a uh, a vast amount of, of information available on, on the internet. And it's a matter of, um, I would say, th the way I go about it is that I have a specific question that I ask. And then I try to look up answers to that question instead of uh, the, the, the wider question of how do I make a parachute. Uh, then it's, uh, I, I sort of ask very specifically into, I want to control the opening sequence of my parachute. What does that take, for example? Um, so, uh, but, but other than that, uh, I sort of anticipated a question like that. So one of the best uh, books in, in the market, that sort of a Bible in the area, is, is the uh, Parachute Recovery Systems by T.W. Knack, down here. Uh, it's not cheap, but uh, I recommend this highly. Mm -hmm. That was actually a question left uh, on on one of the video, uh, on the video as well by Tiago Pavanelli, which is what is the best book about yep. uh, about that parachutes? <laughs> and a heck of a lot of PDFs on on the internet. <laughs> um, then uh, we have one more question from the live stream. Uh, uh, do you allow students to do internships at CS? Uh, we have in the past, uh, but currently we do not have uh, manpower to basically help uh, the, the interns that, that come here. So at the moment, it's, it's unfortunately not possible for interns to, uh, to help us out. Uh, but uh, it, it may be possible again in the future. And then one more question from the live stream. What kind of temperatures uh, do we expect on descent? Uh, so, yeah, and what sort of uh, speeds are we uh, reaching from a suborbital re-entry? Yeah. Uh, hi, <laughs> that's a short answer. We expect um, temperatures in the range of three to 400 uh, Celsius on the way back uh, through the atmosphere. Um, and uh, that translates into, to, or that comes from a speed of roughly uh, Mach 3.5 uh, at max speed during uh, during the re-entry. It's still something that we are fiddling with uh, on, on how we can, uh, as early as possible in the re-entry, uh, do something about because uh, the sooner we can uh, take the top of the speed, the, the, the lower the temperature will be. Uh, so we are, uh, besides the, the balloon that, that I'm working on, we're also looking into other uh, ways of uh, breaking, uh, breaking down the speed uh, during descent. So, so we are looking into if we can do uh, some grid fins on a space capsule or um, a, a peel uh, thing that goes out or anything, other mechanical setup. Uh, so that is something that is being worked on right now. And we have some um, 3D printed uh, models almost ready to be uh, tested uh, within, uh, well, shortly. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, how, how are we going to test those 3D printed models? Uh, <laughs> in a fun way. We, we have this uh, huge building uh, just next door to our workshop, uh, and we're going to climb up to the roof of that, which is 60 to 70 meters uh, above ground. And then uh, the very simple test is to just throw it out. Um, and, and that's one way to do it. We also are so fortunate that uh, we have some friends at a wind tunnel uh, just west of Copenhagen called Copenhagen Air Experience, uh, which is a wind tunnel for uh, skydivers where you can simulate uh, a free fall. And um, they uh, tend to be... Uh, happy to help us out and uh, we also hope that uh, that we'll be able to, to visit their wind tunnel once again and uh, do a more thorough and um, qualified test series of, of uh, whatever we uh, we agree on should be the uh, the main focus for the uh, for the capsule yeah this actually leads into uh, one question <coughs> from live stream by mr attainable uh, he says hi from delft and um, oh one of you guys hello one of them <laughs> uh, and maybe if you could do any experiment with your parachutes, what would you want to measure and how? Um, if if I, can you can you say that again? So if you could do any experiment with any. your parachutes, what would you want to measure and how? <clears throat> the, the the thing I'm most curious about, and which is uh, the first furthest away, uh, mostly 
the most out of reach to us is um, uh, is high speed tests uh, for for the balut. Uh, we are totally in the dark uh, when it comes to uh, to knowing how our balloons work at uh, supersonic speeds. We do not know. Uh, there's a lot of NASA uh, testing that have been done in the, in the uh, early days. So we know from, from what they have done, how the, the balloons behave. Um, and we, we have uh, on a um, uh, textbook level a good idea of what to expect on, a, on, a, on the drag level of the, the balloon. Uh, but on, on the behavior, on, on how stable it's going to be, and uh, the, the, the production side on the, the, um, the strength of what I've done, is that good enough? We simply don't know yet. And if, if I should ask uh, uh, for one test in particular, it would be to find a place where we could do a, uh, a supersonic speed test for, for the balloon. Uh, on the parachute side, I would say that um, it would be cool to get a, um, a full cluster, uh, full setup, uh, space capsule and everything test, uh, just like NASA and uh, how they throw stuff out of an airplane and, um, and just do the real 100% markup test of, of the entire system. Uh, but again, that seems to be, uh, for many reasons, out of our reach. Uh, one of them being economy, of course, that uh, we, we do not have the money for it. Um, the other thing being that uh, we're simply not allowed to do so here in Denmark. Um, <clears throat> which leads to, to another thing, that the reason why we test uh, with a skydiver under our test parachutes, uh, that is because we're allowed to do so uh, basically, but we're not allowed to throw stuff out of an airplane. So Unless it's a person. But he's not stuff, he's a person. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that's why we do what we do. And, and then uh, Steph Moro uh, Moyo Moroina <laughs> asks, uh, at what altitude uh, is the peak heating, I guess, for uh, that's for the ah. space capsule and, and the mm -hmm. balloon, if you know that That's, on top of your head. Uh, um, I can't remember the peak heat. Uh, I remember that we expect to see uh, maximum key levels at about 35 to 40 kilometers altitude, but I believe that we'll see peak heat before that. But uh, honestly, I'm, I'm not sure on, on that area. So um, I can't remember, sorry. Yeah. And one more live uh, stream question from uh, Astronation. Uh, will the capsule be pressurized? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, otherwise, we're going to uh, we're not going to be able to to reuse the uh, the astronaut. <laughs> so uh, uh, hopefully, uh, I'm not sure if something else is meant by that question. But um, the idea is to pressurize the uh, the space capsule in order for the person to be. Uh, um, maybe it's because uh, uh, the question is, if we if we're going to use a spacesuit, perhaps yeah, that's... that could be be why the question is. Otherwise, uh, ask again, of course. Um, <clears throat> right now, we expect to pressurize the space capsule, and then basically just have a, a wetsuit or some other survivor uh, surviving gear on the uh, astronaut, uh, simply to reduce complexity. Um, Everything is dynamic and uh, lots of decisions are still out in the open, of course, but um, the idea is to pressurize the space capsule and and uh, thereby just having the uh, astronaut uh, in, in, in a wetsuit or something inside of that. But uh, do, uh, do ask again if, if that's not what you mean. Then um, Avionics Tech Shop uh, asks does benjamin in florida have a youtube channel uh so we could follow his progress uh i think he uh, he he talks he talked about he wanted to start one actually and he's uh, really uh, magnificent with things with his sewing machine you can follow him follow him on his uh, facebook channel at least uh, bama recovery systems if i remember correctly so look up bama recovery how do you spell that out so... b a m a b a 
Um, then yeah, uh, then and he's doing some uh, really beautiful parachutes, so uh, so do check them out. Yeah. Then T zero MB zero asks, uh, when you have three parachutes on three separate lines, why are they not pulled to the middle and tangle up? Um. Ah. Um. Well. Um. <laughs> We should have a drawing board or something. The, the, the reason is, and you, you, if you saw the, um, <clears throat> if you saw the uh, uh, SpaceX test recently with their uh, manned Dragon version, uh, they used four parachutes in, in their flight. Um, and and what happens is basically when uh, the parachute is, is filled up with air, uh, air goes up into it and spills out again like that. So it comes out and goes out. And that air that goes out again tries to push push away on the other parachutes uh, air flows as well. So that's why you see them go like this all the time. So if the air didn't go out to the side in the bottom, they would kind of stick together. But because of that turbulence that comes, they, they do uh, move a little bit uh, all the time. So that's why. Okay. Uh, then moving over to the... Uh astronaut side for a bit um <clears throat> astronaut geek asks do you know who is going to be the first copenhagen suborbital astronaut no <laughs> <laughs> um we, we don't know who uh, who will who will be taking that uh, that ride and we uh, we still don't know how we're going to decide on that so so that is uh, in many ways uh, a completely open uh, book for us uh, on on, on that uh, on that area, so we don't know. Yeah. Um, maybe you could guide us through uh, what uh, an astronaut would experience in the space in the space capsule from the moment uh, of ignition to splashdown. Well, I think it's important to uh, to mention uh, uh, the time before ignition as well because yeah. uh, I think. Uh, uh, when you look at the the entire trip, um, in 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 some people's mind, the the worst part of the trip is going to be the waiting time, uh, in in many different ways actually. Uh, not only because of the anxiety and the excitement of uh, waiting for the actual launch, but also <clears throat> because uh, if you if you can picture yourself on the launch platform, which is uh, a barge uh, out in the in the open sea, which is going like this on the waves. And then you imagine the, the, the rocket being a 14 meter tall stick on top of that barge here. You're going to experience a lot of uh, motion from, from the waves, basically. So the waiting time uh, during that, you have to be uh, very strong uh, out at sea, basically. So that's, that's one thing. Um, and, and you might end up waiting there for... for a long time before actual launch, so so you have to be uh, you have you have to have a good stomach. Um, then of course we we uh, at one point get to uh, to t to, to t minus zero, uh, and at that point you're going to be the only person within a, a long distance from from uh, the actual rocket. Um, you will hear the uh, the rumbling uh, from the engine, and uh, you will be pushed back into the into your seat uh, or into your harness. Um, and that's another story just in a moment. Um, <clears throat> so basically you will be experiencing up towards perhaps 2 Gs, 3 Gs on the way up. Uh, just before engine cutoff uh, at 50 kilometers altitude, you will um, be pushed all the way back in, into the seat. At that time, uh, the sky outside of the, the window will be black. Uh, and when the engine cuts off, you will be wakeless. Then you have uh, a couple of minutes to enjoy that part of the ride. Uh, but shortly after engine cutoff, you would most likely hear a sort of a bang where the, uh, the booster will be separated from the space capsule. So you would be two floating uh, objects over and other, under each other. Um, you would be flying up to uh, 105 ish kilometers. Um, and then still you wouldn't notice because you'll still just be weightless. Uh, you will have a magnificent view of the, uh, hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll get to turn the, uh, the space capsule to see the entire view of Denmark 
uh, also Bornholm, which is the island that we use as a as a base uh, for the launches. Uh, on the way back, as it looks right now, we expect it to be around uh, 80 kilometers altitude. You will hear another bang or another sound, at least from from the um, nose cone being separated from the space capsule. That's the point where we uh, start doing the braking of, of the descent. So the nose cone will come off, the balut will come out. We will probably also have some other means to, to, to do the braking. And uh, even more important, stabilize the uh, space capsule again. <clears throat> so you want to be, a, be sure that the, uh, the space capsule turns the right side up and down. We do that by, uh, by the, with, the, with the help of the balut and perhaps with the grid fins or some other mechanical mean. Um, then you will slowly start to feel uh, the braking uh, when you start reaching the atmosphere again. And as I said before, at about 40 kilometers, 35 kilometers, you will feel maximum uh, G levels uh, on the way back. And that's going to be around three to three and a half Gs uh, at that point in time. Um, that will soon um, fade down to about, uh, yeah, one G in the end. Um, and at about that time when, when, when you sense that, okay, now we're just at one G, uh, you would also start no noticing the sky being blue again. You will be back in the, uh, in the Earth's atmosphere. Um, you will notice the sounds from the air moving outside of the, uh, the space capsule once again. And then at about five kilometers altitude, you will hear another sound. And that's where things get interesting because that's where you start to learn if, you, if you're going to survive this, because uh, that's where the main parachute will come out. And if you uh, are hit by a giant jolt in the seat and and you uh, move around quickly and um, and then things slow down, then then you should be good. If not, then you have the rest of the life to sort of uh, sort out of that situation that you have uh, put yourself into. Um, after about five minutes onto the main parachute, you will uh, have the last big event, which is basically where you splash down into the Baltic Sea. Um, and we expect that to uh, to be also something that uh, you you will be sure that you know when that happens. Um, um, and then you'll just be waiting, hopefully, in lying there in your space capsule in the sea, bobbing a little bit um, to the right and left, and waiting for the guys to uh, guys and girls to come and uh, and pick you up. Yeah. Uh, do you what sort of uh, impact forces you expect once the capsule uh, uh, reaches water? We uh, that's again something that we are working on these days, and that's also one of the tests that we we are doing pretty soon with the uh, scaled model. Um, um, we we don't know exactly yet, but but uh, the, the boring answer is that we want to reduce those uh, forces uh, as much as possible. Mm -hmm. Uh, do, you have, do you have some sort of estimate based on simulations you've done so um, far? I, I would say, again, uh, it may be for a very short duration, 5Gs, maybe more, but uh, it, it, of course, is something that, uh, that we need to do everything we can to, to, to make as comfortable as possible with springs and uh, what have you. Uh, also, posi the positioning of the uh, space capsule itself, we want it to hit in, in a way that uh, is... Uh, uh, is yeah, basically, it, it cuts itself into the water. Mm -hmm. um, but again, it's it's still something that we, we are working on these days, so we we, we don't know exactly yet. Okay. Is that positioning of the capsule? We have to do something with the par how the parachutes are attached? To it, <clears throat> yeah, we, we can... Uh, we, we can. We have a drawing here we can use, maybe... No, not really. So let's just pretend that you, you have a cylinder um, and you want to, uh, which is in this case, it's not correct in, 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 in the space capsule sense, mm -hmm. but if it's flat in the bottom and, and you have the cylinder, if you hit it, hit it uh, right uh, directly uh, vertically uh, to the water, it's going to be a hard impact. If you turn it over on 90 degrees and let it uh, hit water again, it's going to be a hard impact. But if you turn it 60 degrees or so, or even more perhaps, 
then you, you have this wedge that goes into the water. And that's how you can sort of uh, take the top of the, uh, um, uh, yeah, the, the, the impact by, by making a, a, a wedge shape that hits mm -hmm. the water. Okay. So, so, so that's how you do it. And, and the way we can uh, get that angle right is, is by positioning the anchor point of the, uh, of the parachutes. So by uh, moving the anchor point up or down on the on the space capsule, or by having two anchor points mm -hmm. up to to a common place, mm -hmm. uh, we can decide we, we we can build that angle very easily. So so that's what is is going to be tested pretty soon. Got it. And then uh, maybe this is a little bit out of your scope, but um, it's me. Ashen asks, uh, would there be any chance of the booster smacking back into the capsule after separation? Um, technically, yes, of course. Uh, but but that is something uh, that um, that we uh, uh, actively uh, ha have to uh, to do something about to make sure that that does not happen. But in, in, in theory, uh, it, it would be possible, but uh, that is something that uh, we, we plan on um, making sure it does not happen. And also, one more question from it's me, Ashen. Uh, what difference would there be to how much a single large parachute slows you down compared to how much several, or sev several smaller ones would? Um, if, if, if you um, combine the sizes and make them uh, have uh, the, the same descent speed. Uh, th there would be no, from from what happens where the three parachutes meet and below, uh, wouldn't sense any difference uh, in in descent speed, technically. But the reason why we do it like this is um, two things. Um, or you could put it another way. If you look at the Soyuz, the Russian space capsule, they use one main parachute which is gigantic. Uh, and then they have a backup for that if, if the first one fails. Um, if you look at the Apollo and if, if you look at what is, is being done many other places, uh, they had three smaller ones, which were still huge, um, but they could uh, afford for one of them to, uh, to not work out uh, properly. You saw that on the Apollo 15, that that landed under just two parachutes. Uh, it was landing harder, of course, but uh, it was a survivable landing. Um, so, so we we aim for for that um, uh, that setup with three parachutes. And if you uh, again going back to the question of where do I get the knowledge from? If you look up um, uh, the the reason behind uh, NASA deciding on three parachutes, they 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 made this document that describes um, the, the the statistical reasoning behind why they did what they did. Uh, and that's basically what we are copying in, in, in our concept here. There's also a more pragmatic reason for doing three via parachutes rather than one, and that is um, if you see the uh, the pictures uh, or the movies from from what what I, uh, where I do my uh, sewing and where Benjamin is doing his, you'll notice that we do it in a living room. So we don't have the space for making one big parachute, we hardly have it for the, the, the things that we do already. So it's also a pragmatic reason that we, uh, we, 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 we need to, uh, to make the smaller parachute because that's, that's what we can, basically. Yeah, you said to me today, uh, for the parachutes that we use with the beautiful Betty space capsule, you needed a handball uh, court to basically yeah. uh, pack the parachutes. <clears throat> So ba basically, back in uh, 2013, uh, we did a test with a uh, launch escape system on uh, on a space capsule called Beautiful Betty. Uh, and in order to be able to pack the three parachutes that was uh, used for for that launch, uh, we basically got to uh, to find uh, we had to find a uh, yeah handball court to uh, to get the room for those parachutes. Also, maybe a good thing to mention, if you were in Denmark or visiting Copenhagen, you could actually head over to Denmark's Technical Museum, around 40-minute drive north of Copenhagen at the moment, and we have a few of our uh, rocket pieces on exhibition over there. Uh, so we have uh, the 
space capsule, beautiful, beautiful that you talked just about from the launch escape system back in 2012, 13. Uh, 13. Uh, we have a, uh, an engine from Heat 2X uh, and also Nexo 2, the rocket we flew in August this year on exhibition over there at the moment. And um, Avionics Tech Shop uh, asks, what the parachute build, what is the parachute build formula for payload to canopy ratio? I'm not sure I get that question. Uh, the parachute build formula for payload to canopy ratio. Um, uh, I, okay, so, so, um, I think the question is, how do you calculate um, the size of the parachute uh, to carry a given load? Um, I always forget that uh, formula, honestly. <laughs> so uh, whenever I need to calculate that, there, there are lots of, of those uh, on the web. Uh, you can search um, canopy descent rate um, calculation, and, and you, you should be able to find the... Uh, the formula behind it. And then, um, what sort of uh, materials uh, are we going to use for uh, the, for example, the loot system uh, for speed? <clears throat> um, so un until now, we uh, we have tried to to do uh, to do everything as cheap as possible. So for the uh, next to class rockets, uh, for example, on, on the balloon side, we use, let's see, we have some of the material. This is just a thick nylon material um, that we used. Uh, you can get it uh, very cheap in, in, most, uh, in most shops. <clears throat> um, also, the webbing is, is standard, uh, so nothing fancy in, in, in that area. And uh, obviously, it, it worked uh, perfectly for, for, for next to um, on, on the parachute side, it's uh, a matter of standard uh, parachute uh, nylon as well. Um, F111 or zero porosity. Uh, you could get it uh, also by looking, looking up uh, on Google for parachute uh, nylon. <clears throat> so, so nothing, nothing fancy on, on that side. Um, when you look into the pollute material choice for the descent uh, on the speaker launch uh, and descent through the atmosphere. We are challenged by the fact that uh, we will see a lot of heat there. So uh, nylon would uh, just melt and or burn away. So uh, when it comes to, to that area, we, uh, we have had to look at a little bit more exotic materials, but uh, not any more than just looking into Kevlar, which is, uh, is, is able to tolerate the, the heat uh, levels that, that we anticipate to, to be uh, to reaching so um, for for the the balloon for the uh, space capsule descent we use Kevlar instead and um, and 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 their fun fact is that uh, and again that's where we are just humans and uh, amateurs uh, I guess because uh, in one of the very first uh, small tests I did just on testing the uh, how easy it was to work with the with Kevlar on on the sewing yeah. machine. I, uh, I started the, the usual setup of uh, getting uh, the materials laser cut at uh, a company that has helped us a lot, Cut at DK, and they um, uh, they they cut out all the the pieces that we used, and I started sewing these pieces together. And then I realized, after fortunately just a short while, I realized that uh, at that point I was using the standard nylon. Um, <clears throat> that, I, that I had been using for for um, for the balloon uh, system, and then I realized if if I was going to um, do this the right way from the beginning, I of course also had to use uh, a Kevlar thread for for the balloon. So uh, I had to uh, undo everything I had done and then start all over again with the uh, with the right material, and uh, that was just a stupid mistake to be uh, <laughs> to to make. Good, you caught it. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, it would would have been like uh, twenty four pieces of fabric uh, going through the air in in a in a very yeah. weird way, I guess. Yeah. Um, 
as Chaz asks, uh, what are the limits to uh, our parachute simulation technology, if any? Whoa. Uh, parachute simulation? Yeah. Um, well, uh, if you, when you use the word simulation, uh, I hardly think there are any limits. Um, and I also know that it is possible for us to, uh, to, to, to do the simulations uh, and we have done a few of them uh, some years back on the balloon system. That's that's from from that point we we have the expectation of, of temperatures reaching three to four hundred degrees. <clears throat> um, so it's it's the the challenges uh, from from our point of view is not the simulation side, it's the testing. Uh, we need to be uh, damn sure that uh, that the production quality of what we're doing is, is uh, high enough. And as I said very early on, uh, that's where I constantly meet my inner fear, that is, uh, am I good enough for, for this? Um, so, so I think that's where the, the, the big issue is for us. That's testing, not simulation. Um, we get, and it, we, we, we love all the, the, uh, the engagement that comes to us uh, in, in people that wants to help us on, on the simulation side and the theoretical side, but uh, we are a, a group that, that builds and ma manufactures rockets and, and rocket-related stuff. So what we constantly need is people who can make this. Uh, the, the, the theoretical and the simulation side is, is well covered. Um, so so it's, it's on the production side that the uh, we have our challenges. And then a question from Shrimpanzee is, how does the parachute ejection system actually work? Um, that is something that is uh, being designed at the moment as well. Um, the the setup that we used on Nexo was uh, pretty basic, um, uh, that we had a um, we had a gas cartridge from basically a um, uh, the, the the gas generator from from an airbag in a car. We had two of those, slightly bigger, but uh, <clears throat> same principle. And we had them on top of the uh, of the rocket in in the nose cone. And at a given time, we we basically just ignited them, and they blew off the uh, the nose cone, which uh, made the the balloon um, open to the air outside. Uh, uh, so that was how we, we ejected the, the balloon uh, on the next rocket. At the uh, desired altitude, we then just released the balloon, and that was connected. The the, uh, the riser from the balloon was connected further down to the uh, deployment bag of the main parachute. So when we released the uh, the balloon, that pulled out the uh, the main deployment bag for the main parachute. So that was a very basic system we used there. I, I expect that we're going to use the same uh, system for the um, for the main parachute on the, uh, on the on the space capsule, but we are probably going to use a more active way of uh, shooting out the the balloon um, on, on the space capsule, and it, it might be something with a yeah, basically a canister being ejected with uh, with some sort of cold gas or another similar technology. But but we are not uh, working on that right now. But uh, uh, we have to do so pretty soon. Okay. Ryan Stelly commented on the on the video a few weeks ago. Uh, if uh, we ever looked at graphene for uh, meshed shoot to slow down descent prior to the main shoots. Mm, I haven't looked in, into that specific material. Um, I, so so uh, the, the short answer is no. Uh, if if uh, you have any knowledge on, on that area and uh, know that it's uh, specifically a very good thing to use for uh, temperatures at three to four hundred degrees, it's good at uh, it's good to work with on a on a home sewing machine, and uh, you can you can make a balloon that is. Uh, um, can contain the air within it and, and stuff like that, please let us know because uh, as it looks right now, we're pretty happy with the uh, with the Kevlar, but um, if something that is better and or cheaper comes up, then, then we're of course open for, uh, for suggestions, always. 
Actually, quite a few people asked um, whether we will have an escape system uh, for the capsule on the speaker rocket. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, we, 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 currently, we do not plan on it. Um, the, the, the problem is that um, every, every time you add something to, to, uh, to our system here, we, uh, we add complexity and uh, danger, basically. So adding uh, something that can also uh, ignite uh, also adds um, things that can go wrong. So, so the idea is at the moment that we do not uh, add any uh, ejection system or launch escape system or, or anything like that. Um, that's the plan at the moment, at least. Um, and, and one of the reasons behind it, it goes back to, I think, uh, 2014, <clears throat> where an argument came up. Uh, it, it wasn't planned to show up in, in, in that sense, but uh, we, we got it anyway. Because uh, when we did the, the uh, HEAT 2X uh, all-up test uh, on a test stand, just almost outside of the workshop, uh, if people can remember that uh, test, they will remember that it burned up uh, on the test stand. If you haven't seen that test yet, go look for HEAT 2X on our channel. It is a fantastic video of a rocket burning up. you got to see it. Um, so, and when you do see the video, you have to think that on top of that rocket uh, that you see in the video, we had placed a parachute system and a temperature sensor to see what is going to happen there, uh, where someday a uh, person would be going, going forward uh, some, some years. So we placed uh, the parachute system and we placed uh, a temperature sensor. And that was meant for a nominal test for the, the engine burning as it was supposed to. And it's, instead, the engine burned up and we had a lot of fire and uh, a lot of heat. But still, in the parachute compartment, the temperature never got over 40 degrees Celsius. And that was uh, in a setup where we had the entire uh, uh, full amount of alcohol running out of the, um, the rocket in just a few seconds out uh, just below it and burning up uh, instantaneously. When you think of that situation and this temperature never got above 40 degrees in the compartment of the uh, parachute system, then if you can compare that to a situation at sea where the, uh, the, the floor of the, the platform, launch platform, is just an, an open component and the, the uh, liquid will just run through it and into the ocean, uh, the fire hazard would be less than it was uh, at the engine test we had in 2014. So if, if the same situation should, should come up there, for example, um, I think it would be actually a, a somewhat safe situation to be in, uh, to just stay and wait it out in, in the space capsule for, for that particular. Uh, uh, of course, many things can happen on the way up, and we have to uh, make a system in the um, in the event of things uh, going wrong below the the space capsule, and then the 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 the, um, the task for us is to identify what can go wrong, how does it go wrong, and then figure out how can we separate the uh, the space capsule in in other ways from those things going on below it, and then get away safely. But uh, adding a launch escape system in in in, in our setup is something that we do not feel comfortable in doing. Okay. Paul Ubakwen um, is asking, we already went through his question a little bit in more detail, so if you want, you can later on uh, go back into the live stream uh, once, it posts, once it's posted uh, as a video and go look into the more in-depth answer. But you could just quickly answer, are we planning to do a full-scale test of the overall system? So, balloon, parachute, and capsule? Uh, it would be nice to do so, but uh, as it looks now, we do not have the, uh, the capacity or the money or the uh, legal requirements to, to do so. So, uh, uh, we have to be uh, creative uh, in, in finding other ways to, to get as close as possible to, to such a test. Also, seeing you work... Um, on a system that will keep the capsule afloat. Oh, yeah. So maybe you can also expand a little bit on that. <clears throat> so um, 
Yeah, we when when the uh, the capsule lands uh, at, in the Baltic, we want to make sure that it keeps the float, uh, making sure that we can uh, use the astronaut once more uh, for other means. Uh, so basically, we want to this the, the space capsule is designed to to be kept afloat by itself, but uh, we want to make sure that that is absolutely going to happen. So we uh, we are also building some uh, flotation devices, which is basically just a, a bunch of beach balls uh, that we contain in um, in something, and that is uh, something that I um, it's it's more or less almost a copy of the balloon that I, I made last year, but just in a more round shape. Uh, to contain the uh, beach balls. And uh, we expect to have three of those. This is one of them. Um, uh, placed uh, strategically uh, on the space capsule to keep it uh, the right side up and uh, yeah, basically keeping it afloat until uh, help arrives to carry out the, the person inside of the, the space capsule. Yeah. And then one more question left on the video a few weeks ago is from uh, Nasir Ashknani. Um, he says, hi, is it possible to, man to maneuver a parachute to retrieve a rocket near the initial point of launch? Uh, the short answer is yes. Um, the longer answer is, but we won't do it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, the idea is that, uh, again, every, every time you want to you want to add uh, something that is cool to do or um, uh, yeah basically every time you add something to the system you add something that also can go wrong so if you um, if you add controllability to, to your parachute uh, what if that um, what if the the uh, motors that uh, the, the levers that control the parachute what if they lock up what if they continue to, to do something that is wrong or something like that? Um, we've seen it uh, being done a lot in, in amateur rocketry uh, and also in unmanned flights uh, that uh, you can do uh, various stuff to, uh, to have a um, ram air parachute that you can control where it goes. But for, for our uh, purpose, we do not want to add that complexity, even though it would, it would be uh, intensely cool to do so. Um, what we do instead is <clears throat> that we um, we work on on uh, figuring out to to uh, calculate the, the descent of the parachute and try to be able to uh, predict the the path that uh, the space capsule takes, and uh, then we can either fly it against that path in order for it to land sort of near where it started out. Or we can say, okay, let's make the uh, rocket fly straight up, and then we know it's going to land uh, eight kilometers in, in this or that direction. And then we can start uh, sending out the fleet to, uh, to that landing area. And that is something that uh, we, uh, we tested out with the Nexo 2 rocket. Mm -hmm. And uh, if, we, um, if we look at the, the altitude that we reached with the six and a half kilometers uh, apogee, and we put that into the model that, that I made uh, for, for that specific flight uh, and all of the various information we had on wind speeds and directions. We predicted a uh, landing point which was 4.4 kilometers away uh, in a certain direction and we, we landed 200 meters from that point. So uh, it, it, it seems that it's possible to, to be rather um, good at predicting that landing point. So if, if we can do that, that would be a safer way to, uh, to get the person to, to land and predict where he's going to land and then get over to, to uh, the capsule in, in that way instead. Yeah, just let me find a question over here. Uh, so uh, Christopher uh, Kissiels asks on uh, the video posted a few weeks ago, uh, for the next launches, at which moment are the parachutes deployed? Um, <clears throat> that, we, we had two moments there uh, and a lot of backup, backup situations. Um, the um, balloon was um, programmed to, uh, to come out when the descent speed was... 
the reasoning was we wanted to, the balut to come out not before it was able to, uh, to carry itself afloat. So uh, we did some calculation on that, and it seemed like it was going to be able to carry itself at a wind speed of more than 8 meters per second. Uh, and then we decided that, okay, let's, let's have a uh, vertical uh, speed of 10 meters per second before we let the balloon come out. So that was the rule um, for, for the balloon. We have to have a vertical descent speed of more than 10 meters per second before we, we, we eject the uh, nose cone. That was the first rule. Uh, then we had a rule for the uh, the main capsule to come out at, I already forgot, I think it was uh, three kilometers uh, that we told the uh, guidance to, to use um, as, as a, uh, altitude for, for the main. And that, uh, that was the second altitude we used there. And then we had uh, the third uh, rule that uh, if nothing had come out, or no matter what, actually, we, we had also some of the um, gas generators in the bottom of the uh, main parachute compartment. And we had a rule saying that no matter what, at 500 meters altitude, they should fire in order to just throw out the damn thing into the air, basically, um, if, if the parachute hadn't come out at that point. So those were the main uh, steps we had for, for that. So Avionics text tube mentions that you, you have mentioned a lot of useful learning videos on the website and this live chat and if we could include links later in the description. Uh, so I guess we'll try to do that <laughs> afterwards. And also link uh, the address where to send donations. So the, the, dona the donations you can um, find on our website, which is copsub.com. We have the donation section. Slash support dash us. Yeah, that's an easier way to find it. Um, also, you can use the super chat feature we have uh, on the live stream as well. Uh, you can donate money directly through the chat on YouTube. And on that note, it's important to, to uh, tell you guys that all the donations that you uh, bring to our project, they go directly to uh, materials or to uh, rocket fuel, basically. Uh, the, all of the people that work here in Copenhagen Suburbitus, we work for free in our spare time. So every every last cent that you give goes directly into uh, into the project. Yeah, some of it goes to pay the rent for uh, for the workshop as well. Yeah. Um, then uh, one more guy, Nintendo Nest Nerd, uh, asked, "How long does it take you to make one parachute?" And oh. when is the first man <laughs> flight going to be? Um, it takes a long time. I, I, I don't have the nerve to, to think about how long it takes. Uh, way too long. Don't even ask my family. Um, um, so so it, it's many, 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 many hours uh, for each component that we make. Um, I, I simply can't tell you. It, it takes a long time. Um, and when, when's the first manned launch? Yeah. Uh, within 10 years, I hope. Uh, but it all comes down to, to the problem again that uh, we have the man hours here readily available, but uh, uh, now we're standing here with a hat in our hand basically saying that um, what is, is always keeping us back is the, uh, the speed with which we can buy the, the components that are available. So um, it's a matter of also the donations that come into the project. But uh, hopefully within 10 years. Uh, yeah, Paul Ubach uh, asks if we have any plan to do a full-scale parachute test anytime soon. Mm, that would be cool. Um, I think the next test is going to be um, to be the balloon, uh, the uh, the Kevlar balloon, uh, which I may be able to show you guys. Hold on. <coughs> so just to give you an idea, sorry, just to give you an idea, this is the uh, one of the uh, cores for the balloon, and I'm just going to roll it out here. So we have. Where are those? 
and they're going to be uh, put together and once that is done um, it's a matter of uh, throwing a guy out of a plane Ahmed, you know who you are um, once again how that behaves uh, basically uh, the last time when he did with the uh, the jump with the next two two uh, balloon he had a speed if I remember correctly of about uh, 150 kilometers per hour vertically uh, this is a uh, much uh, bigger balloon than that one so uh, Maybe he will have time to take pictures or eat his lunch or something on the way down next time. Um, so so let's see uh, how that goes. But that's going to be the next text, next test. Sorry. Um, we um, I think we we are going to wait a little bit with a with a triple cluster test again because uh, uh, we, we I think it it will be better to to focus on the balut for now and then get back to the other component a little bit later on in order to not um, focus on too many things at once. So so the next is, is definitely going to the balloon and then uh, we'll see what happens. <clears throat> so uh, Cooper Robot asked uh, you that basically you are shot into space on a bullet built by amateurs. Uh, so what made you want to be in it? Why wouldn't you? I mean, come on. It's going to be a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Um, I don't know. Um, I think, why Why do you go to a concert? I mean, that's one of the standard questions I give because the sound is usually terrible. It's crowded. It's um, cold, wet, whatever. But you still enjoy the concert. And it's because you're part of something. You're part of uh, something bigger and you experience something unique at the concert. And to me, I think it's the same thing that, um, yeah, there's lots of videos available on how it feels like to go to, uh, to space and back again. But, but uh, I expect, and that's also what you hear from those who have tried it, something unique. And uh, uh, I, I recently was part in, in an event where they, they were talking about this overview experience of getting to understand the concept of being part of something bigger. And, uh, and that is something that I would uh, very much like to experience for myself. So uh, that's, that's basically why I want to do it. Yeah, Brunching out from that, uh, Dak Capo 88 had a <coughs> question, uh, what is the selection process for the astronauts? Yeah, we, we touched upon that a little bit earlier on, but, mm -hmm. uh, but basically, um, we, we haven't decided yet who is going to take the seat, and we haven't decided on how to decide that yet. So uh, we, we simply don't know. Uh, still some, some years out in the future, and uh, I think for the moment uh, all of us are, are more focused on, on all of the, uh, the more technical aspects of, of this project. Uh, but it's true that at some point we have to decide on, on how to decide this, uh, but we are not there yet. Uh, Avionics Tech Soup, thank you very much for the super chat donation. Yay! Uh, yeah. um, this is a little bit out of our scope, I guess. Uh, it's by uh, Master MZML. Is how to become an astronaut and what profession should be pursued? Find a fun project and take part in it. <laughs> <laughs> That's how. Uh, yeah, that's how we do it, basically. Um, good question. I think um, I, I, it's hard to say that we're the right ones to answer that question. We're not, I think we're not doing it in the we're typical it, way. No, in the right way. But um, uh, are, are we then the wrong stuff? I don't know. <laughs> you could say that. Mm. But but um, I think um, I think what is more important here that. Uh, that you follow your passion and uh, and you stick to it and um, do what you find interesting, and then somehow uh, you you may end up uh, in the right in the right place at the right time. But um, uh, but but a, a good advice on on how to become an astronaut, I I have no clue. I'm not one yet, at least. Yeah. 
Yeah, and uh, also Thomas Webb uh, asked a similar question. What steps have we taken towards astronaut training and how extensive uh, is it going mm -hmm. to be? Uh, none and don't know. Um, we, um, I think, uh, the, the, the people who are at the, at the current moment uh, volunteering for, for the position, our focus is right now to figure out how to, to set up the, the interior of the space capsule. So that's what we are working together on, um, together with, with the people who are able to actually build stuff uh, in that area. Um, and and if, if you want a sneak peek into what we are really right now discussing, then uh, it, it, and the issue is that, that we are having is that uh, a typical seed that we want to put into the uh, space capsule that can be rather heavy. So right now we are discussing, could we find another way of, of uh, placing this uh, person into the uh, space capsule? So um, next week, actually, I'm going to pick up um, a, uh, a harness for a paragliding uh, system. And we're going to see if that is going to, uh, to work out OK. Uh, instead of a uh, hard physical uh, seat in, uh, in the capsule, like in a race car, whatever, then we're going to see, can we do, can we do it with a yeah, paragliding harness instead? And that's going to be pretty fun and pretty cool to see if, uh, if that works out. Um, one of the very early on uh, questions that came was, well, if, if we, uh, the first idea was to just hang him in springs or her, uh, and then we, we quickly realized, but when the engines turn off, he's going to be shot up into the, into the top of the, uh, uh, the space capsule. So of course he will also need to have springs below him and on the side and stuff like that. But that's what we're going to see. Uh, is that something that is going to save weight and uh, and, and and room in, in the uh, capsule? <clears throat> yeah. And then Omer uh, Magan asks, what are the legal concerns and insurance stuff involved with sending a man uh, la, la, into la, space la, 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 on an la, la, amateur la, la, la. rocket um, uh, with the immense <laughs> risks involved in it? Um, uh, I think. Um, Fortunately, uh, I know from uh, skydiving that uh, it is possible to get to get insurance at least for for skydivers. Um, and I think uh, when the time comes, maybe we could uh, have a discussion uh, on a personal level for the astronaut uh, on on that area. Um, on the legal side, I would say that um, we have a very close cooperation with the authorities in 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 Denmark and Sweden and and uh, everywhere around where it's it's necessary. So, um, so, so for our point of view, it's um, it's not as much uh, legal uh, problems that we have. It's it's just more a matter of making sure that uh, we we. I would rather say we get the help that we need from from the local authorities. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, it's important for us that uh, that the airspace over the launch site is cleared on on the launch day, in order for us not to hit any uh, planes um, on the way up. So we have and a close down. or down, <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> so so we have of course uh, a very close cooperation with the uh, uh, Swedish air traffic control um, in order to make sure that uh, we do uh, do the launches uh, as safe as possible. So Robert uh, Steinbeiswood asks, uh, what are your thoughts about the first European manned space flight? Um, well, there, there have been European astronauts going up, so that's obviously not what it's meant. I think um, we are, of course, very proud of the um, of the thought of us being possibly the first um, entity that can bring a person into space from European ground. Um, so, so that is something uh, that uh, on a bad day can uh, motivate us all. Uh, on the other side, I would say that, that much of what we're doing is also sort of a, something that we also just do for ourselves and because we cannot stop ourselves from doing this. So um, on, on a day-to-day -day basis, we do not think about all of these grander things of, 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 of the, the project. But every once in a while, you know that you just had a tour this morning 
uh, when people come into our workshop and they see what we do, uh, they see how we do it, uh, we always get reminded of how crazy this is and how far we have come with uh, so few resources. So in, in that perspective, it, um, every once in a, in a while we remind ourselves ourselves on, on how crazy this is. But on a day-to-day -day basis, you tend to forget it when you sit there hour after hour behind your sewing machine and you just go... Um, uh, so, so, but every once in a while we, we get this reminder of, of the grandeur of, of the project. And then it's, 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 it's fantastic, absolutely. Mohat has a question of how he could join us. Come by. It helps if you're living in Copenhagen, uh, of course, and just draw, you can draw by for a visit, of course, and then we can talk further uh, how you could get involved, what are, what are your competencies and where you could find place in the organization. Yeah, I think what we most need uh, in general in, in, the, in the group is people who can weld. Yeah. So uh, again, this is a workshop um, where we put stuff together to... to uh, Typically, I would say what we put together is the stuff that puts together the rocket. Uh, and then every once in a while, we actually build on the rocket itself. So you have to be a good, uh, you have to be skilled with the tools. Yeah. Uh, Avionics Tech Soup, uh, again, uh, mentions uh, that uh, he would like, or he or she would like to make parachute builds possible uh, for uh, my students. So following, following our work, uh, or being part of a CS build group uh, would be very helpful. Uh, so thanks for sharing uh, all the journey. <laughs> mm -hmm. You're welcome. Yeah. Sorry, <laughs> avionics tech shop, not soup. <laughs> Someone. Yeah. Uh, um, then we're running a little bit uh, drier on questions, so. If you still have something on your mind, uh, feel free to po shoot them at us. Yeah. We covered this one a little bit, but Norban, uh, Nordman Paul uh, asked uh, if we do drop tests like NASA. Uh, unfortunately not. Uh, drop tests uh, in, in is, is very much CS. DIY style, uh, DIY style, <clears throat> that uh, we basically go to a skydiving club uh, here in Denmark uh, and and uh, go up with an airplane and uh, one skydiver under our parachute uh, system and two others who uh, document the the trip and then myself who basically throw out the parachute system after the uh, the skydiver who who does a test jump. And um, that's how we can test the, 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 the parachute system. Um, it would be cool and great and nice if we could uh, do an, an, an all-up test on, on the entire system uh, with a boilerplate somehow, but uh, with our uh, economy and uh, the, the legal aspects of us not being allowed to drop stuff uh, out of an airplane over Danish territory, then um, it, it seems... Uh, like we're not going to be able to do that. So the, the all-up tests that we can do, they are going to be very live tests uh, in under actual launches. Uh, Emmanuel uh, Alejandro says greetings from Bolivia, so greetings from Copenhagen. Uh, Omer Magan asks whether we play Kerbal Space. Uh, <laughs> I've I've tried it a couple of times, but uh, everything uh, always goes wrong for me. So, uh, so I'm not good at it. Unfortunately, uh, I play a sewing machine instead. <laughs> uh, but it, it it's it's great fun, and we have seen actually um, that uh, cups of material has uh, has been used there. So we have seen uh, some of our rockets being uh, replicated in Kerbal Space. Uh, so uh, we we are very much aware of the of the, the ecosystem. Yeah. Yeah. yeah Paul Ubach uh, asks, uh, how many volunteers have we in the organization currently? 
uh, I think we always tend to say around 50. It's hard to count uh, when a person is, is uh, qualified to, to be called, um, well, uh, around 50. That's the rough number we always give. Mm -hmm. uh, Peter Scoot uh, asks, have we ever thought about using a tandem jump to emulate a greater weight? Of course. <laughs> uh, we, we've discussed uh, different setups for, uh, for how to, 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 uh, to get closer to the uh, spot on the, the weight we want to simulate. Uh, but in the end, everything comes down to safety on those jumps. Um, and, and I would say that um, since safety is, is the most important thing for such a jump, um, the, the short answer is we, we are not going to, to, to do that because uh, already with just one per person under the parachute, uh, it, is, it is dangerous. It is um, something that we have to be very uh, careful with what we do. So uh, adding another person just again back to the concept of adding complexity, that's just not a way to go. So do with just uh, the weight that Ahmed has, and it's unfortunate I heard that he uh, he lost some weight recently. So uh, he's he's <laughs> even worse to use now, but uh, he's he's still uh, our best he's he's our best space capsule dummy. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, so that's how we do, and we and we can get close to uh, uh, do the calculations backwards to to getting an understanding of of how the space capsule will work instead of him under the parachute. So uh, it's good enough for for uh, the setup we have, but we have considered it absolutely. As considered collaborating with a foreign space agency such as the ISRO. Um, I think uh, collaborations as such um, in, in a formalized way are, are not uh, relevant as far as I know, but, but I know that we, we often get visits by uh, people from other space agencies um, who come visit us in, in our workshop. And uh, we also get uh, contacted uh, every now and then on mail or phone by uh, by people from other agencies, and and they tend to be uh, very helpful to us whenever we we have a question. Also, the other way around, uh, I know that that I've placed questions uh, here and there, and uh, I would say that uh, most often I, I do get a very useful answer. So uh, it's it's more on the um, on the personal level that, that we get those interactions. And that's also more in the spirit of, of Copenhagen Suborbital that it is a, a, a private uh, group of uh, people doing this in our spare time. So, so I think getting a formalized uh, agreement with a space agency that could perhaps just push the boundary a little bit on, on who we are, I don't know. Uh, I think we're doing fine as we do right now, so. Um. Expanding a little bit on that collaboration point, uh, Amar uh, Magendo asks uh, if we have a Discord uh, server uh, or other ways to communicate, uh, other people to com communicate with our community. Uh, we have our Facebook uh, group, uh, our page. Uh, we have our homepage, copsup.com, um, where you can put comments on under our blog site, uh, Twitter, YouTube, um, Instagram. So that's, there are lots of places where you can uh, write to us and uh, we try to as good as possible to uh, to get back to uh, each and every uh, comment there. Uh, but we do not have a uh, discussion forum as such. Uh, but but maybe in the future. I don't know. Somehow. But we, we do not have that uh, a, a forum uh, in, in such a way right now. Yeah. I think this this setup here today was actually quite a good way to get some questions and answers in both ways. Uh, so maybe we will continue more on these live streams in the future as well. 
and then uh, going back more to the technical uh, stuff, uh, mm -hmm. Avionics Tech Shop uh, has a question, what type of needles do you use to sew gondolas together for Kevlar parachute system? Uh, the sharp ones. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's actually, um, <laughs> quite surprisingly, just uh, standard needles um, that, that are used for that. So um, nothing fancy in, in that area. And 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 the standard uh, sewing machine as well. Um, I think where the, the the main issue is when you. Um, I was so fortunate that that I had the opportunity of have the uh, of having the uh, the fabric cut out uh, on a on a laser cutter. Uh, had I had to do that by hand, it would be a hell, because uh, using a pair of scissors on uh, on the Kevlar fabric that uh, that's that's terrible. Um, but but uh, sewing with a needle on it uh, is no problem at all. Yeah. Paul Ubach says he doesn't live in Copenhagen, so he can't help us uh, in hardware, but is there any way for him to help us design software, for example? Mm, I think, uh, again, it's a matter of writing us, telling us about your competencies and uh, let's have a discussion uh, I don't. I don't think it's a good discussion that uh, should be uh, put here, to yeah. be honest. But uh, uh, we we always uh, need help in various areas. But uh, that that depends very much on on where your skills are. And um, where could he write? He uh, could write us uh, on contact at copsop dot com. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Avionics Tech Shop says surprising and thank you. John Lynn commented uh, that our skydiver skydiver could always uh, fill up his pocket with some extra sand uh, to make up for the lost we, weight. Uh, we, we, we joked about that actually already, so uh, <laughs> even before his weight loss. <laughs> <laughs> but again, coming back to safety uh, all the time, um, uh, we, uh, we tend to be, uh, we try to be reasonable uh, in the end, but... Uh, a lot of uh, creative ideas always come up uh, before the actual jump. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think we'll take maybe another few last questions and then we'll try to wrap up. Mm -hmm. So there's <coughs> one from knews.space uh, saying, is there a use case for compressed air instead of parachutes? The idea is to compress, suck in air on the way down and use it for a suicide-ish burn before impact or <laughs> small payloads. Mm. I'd like to see that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so suck up air. I mean, we want to break as early as possible, so uh, we want to do that already when there's almost no air and then there's nothing to suck up. Um, <laughs> it's, it's a fun question, actually. Um, uh, I, 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 I wouldn't be the one to test that. Let me put it like that. But uh, it's it's a fun uh, thought experiment. Yeah. Um, that that perhaps needs a little more um, work. That idea. But yeah, fun concept. And then one more uh, question from a few weeks ago by J O Watson was: If we get high levels, high enough funding, would we consider going to orbit? Uh, if if uh, I would rather say if we get high enough, uh, a big enough amount of money, uh, we would uh, in the first run go to space sooner. Um, so we we going to space in in a suborbital trip is uh, difficult enough. So that's the only thing we we think of right now. Um, what will happen afterwards? No idea. But um, but. Our only goal right now is uh, is, is to go to space uh, in, in the suborbital trip. And uh, every uh, last uh, cent uh, that we get goes uh, in that direction and, and nothing else. Yeah. So I think I uh, will thank you all for the questions that we had. I think it was a pretty nice first go at this live Q&A setup. I know we've missed some of the questions that uh, were maybe concer concerning other departments such as Booster and so forth, uh, but we'll make sure... I'm not sure skilled enough to answer <laughs> those questions. So. Exactly. We'll make <laughs> sure to write them down for some other future Q&As, and we hope to do them uh, 
more often, uh, hopefully once every month or so. So we'll try to include them uh, on further Q&As that we have with people who are maybe from the booster department. Mm -hmm. So yeah, and thank you very much for tuning in and uh, all your support. And thank you for your questions. Thank you for your questions. And if you feel like you'd like to become part of the organization by a donation, because uh, I think it's also important to say that we're not only 50 to 60 guys working on this project, but we actually have hundreds of people around the world who actually bring money and support into this project that are also quite a big part. Absolutely. Of and, it. And, uh, and the way that we, for example, show that is uh, on the on the next year rockets that we launched, we uh, we had a picture of uh, all the people who sent us money that they can also send us a picture of themselves and and they got to be uh, positioned on the rocket uh, for the launch and right now actually if you are in 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 the area of uh, the technical museum you can go and see the rocket and you can go and see the people who supported us yeah and if you're one of the people who did support you can go to the museum and see your face <laughs> in yep. the exhibition as well so now you're on exhibition yep Alrighty. Thank you very much. Thank for, you very much. For this. Yeah. And uh, we'll see you on the next live stream. Mm-hmm.